So I also want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present some of our latest work with you here today. Uh, we saw yesterday a slide from Billy showing the prevalence of uh, metabolic disease and obesity worldwide. This is a map of the US, in fact, which is a uh, heat uh, colored map showing the increased incidence of obesity uh, in the US. Now, concomitant with the increase in obesity, there is increase in insulin resistance, which will lead to type 2 diabetes. So one major focus for, for us and the research interest we're doing is try to understand how insulin resistance leads to the development of diabetes and what are the signaling mechanisms which are happening in the periphery to regulate glucose level. In particular, we are focused on the pancreas, the liver, and the adipose tissue. But for this presentation today, I'm gonna focus only on our work in the adipose tissue. Uh, one major aspect for signaling in these different tissues and how they communicate with each other is a process of tyrosine phosphorylation. Uh, so we really try to get the details of alterations in signaling with a particular focus on alterations in tyrosine phosphorylation and dephosphorylation and how aberrations in these pathways will lead to the development and the pathogenesis of, of diabetes and other metabolic diseases. Uh, tyrosine phosphorylation is very neat for regulation of signaling, as we all know. It is key because it is at least partly reversible. So it's really under the control of two key players of family members, the protein tyrosine kinases, which act to phosphorylate the, the target protein. And for most part, this will lead to the activation of the protein. On the other hand, the proteins which we work on, which are the protein tyrosine phosphatases, which will work to dephosphorylate the target protein and for most part will lead to the inactivation of the protein. So this balance between the kinases and the phosphatases is very important for regulation of cellular homeostasis. And when this process is disrupted, it will lead to pathogenesis of disease. So as I mentioned, we focus on the protein tyrosine phosphatases and in humans there are 37 protein tyrosine phosphatases. One key point which I want to stress, especially for this meeting, is one major mechanism for the regulation of the activity of all the family members of the protein tyrosine phosphatases, as shown by Nick Tonks and several other groups, including Shigari, is oxidation. So reversible oxidation will inactivate the phosphatases. And this is very important, especially in the context of this meeting. The other thing which was recently found is that nitrosylation also will regulate the activity of these phosphatases. And both oxidation and nitrosylation will reversibly inactivate the phosphatases. After a while, they will be re-reduced, and this reduction will activate them again. Uh, so overall, the family member is divided into the receptor-like protein tyrosine phosphatases, shown here, and the non-membrane-bound protein tyrosine phosphatases. My lab works on both family of the phosphatases, but for the context of this talk, I'm going to focus on one phosphatase called protein tyrosine phosphatase 1b, which I will refer to from now on as PTP1b. Uh, PTP1B was one of the first phosphatases to be cloned back in the early 80s. This is a cartoon depiction of the phosphatase. On the C-terminal side, it is anchored very tightly on the cytoplasmic face of the endoplasmic reticulum. On the amino side, you have the phosphatase domain. So it's almost like sticking out into the cell, trying to grab hold of the substrates to dephosphorylate and inactivate. And because it was it's expressed in all the different tissues in the body, and because it was one of the first PTPs to be cloned, a lot of work has been done on it, mostly in cell culture systems, to indicate that this phosphatase plays a major role in regulating integrin signaling and growth factor receptor pathways, including the receptor tyrosine kinases. But major insight into the physiological role of the phosphatase PTP1B came from the generation of a whole body knockout mice by two different labs, and the phenotype was very similar in that 
the knockout mice of PTP1B, when PTP1 was removed from all the different tissues in the body, these mice were hyper responsive to insulin. And this was due, at least in part, that this phosphatase acts on the dephosphorylation of the insulin receptor. So this was very interesting. The other interesting observation was that the whole body knockout mice of PTP1B were lean and were resistant to high fat diet induced obesity, at least in part because this phosphatase regulates JAK2 kinase downstream of the leptin receptor signaling pathway. Uh, in addition to all of these effects, there was no obvious side effects of the deletion of PTP1B, and I'm not showing you here as well, there are inhibitors of PTP1B which are tested in mice and in monkeys, and both of these show that the, either the deletion of PTP1B or its inhibition will be good potentially for improving the insulin response and for treating obesity. So along these lines, one major factor for us going forward is to understand where are the sites, what are the tissues which mediate PTP1B action, and what is the mechanism underlying its action. So to that end, we wanted to figure out what are the additional targets of PTP1B, in addition to the insulin receptor and JAK2, because I really believe there are other targets which are mediating the actions of PTP1B. So what we did, we took the PTP1B knockout mice, we isolated the fat cells from these mice, so this way we have no endogenous phosphatase, and back into the knockout cells, we reintroduced the human form of the phosphatase. So now we have isogenic cells, where the only difference between the two cell types is only the expression of the phosphatase. In addition to the reconstitution with the wild type, we also put in a different cell type what is known as a substrate trapping mutant, which was developed by Nick Tonks's lab as well. And this is important because the action of the phosphatase on its targets is very quick. So we are not able to capture that using regular approaches. So what Nick's lab developed is a mutant, and as the name implies, this mutant will physically trap its substrates and prevents them from being dephosphorylated. And this allows investigators in the field to figure out what are the physiological targets of the PTPs, including in this case PTP1B. Long story short, this work is published already. I will not really go into detail, but we have the cell line system, and these fat cells are able to differentiate and become real fat cells in culture. And this allowed us to go forward and try to use these cells to figure out what are the targets of the phosphatase in the adipose tissue. So along these lines, I'm showing you here data from the substrate trapping experiment. So what we did is we took the substrate trapping mutant cell lines, which were differentiated now, so now they are adipocytes. These were left starved overnight with no stimulation at all or they were insulin stimulated for 10 and 30 minutes. What we did then is we pulled down the phosphatase and looked for the proteins which are hyperphosphorylated, with the idea being that if a substrate of PTP1B, it should be protected from dephosphorylation and it should be hyperphosphorylated in the gel. And indeed, when there's no insulin stimulation, you don't see much phosphorylation of the different proteins. However, after insulin stimulation and the substrate trapping mutant two different bands of hyperphosphate proteins appearing at about 68 and 150 kilodaltons were observed, suggesting that these are potential substrates of the phosphatase in the fat. So what we did, we did a massive blue staining, and we subjected these uh, bands to mass spec, and I was hoping that we will find, you know, four or five different targets, makes my, our life easier. However, it's not really so simple, and in fact, we ended up having 30 or 40 different potential targets. So the question is, where do we start? It's always reassuring that we found already published substrates of PTP1B. So it gave us assurance that our data is in line, and we can potentially identify different substrates as well. Uh, we found a number of different potential substrate families. I just want to point your attention is, is a new subset of targets of the phosphatase, and these are already published now, to show that PTP1B regulates proteins involved in the endoplasmic reticulum stress pathway and the unfolded protein response. Addition, we found targets which are involved in cell adhesion, which I will not go in detail today on, but one target which got my attention, which was really high on the list, was pyruvate kinase M2. 
And for me, it was interesting because I know from the work of Luke Antley and a few other investigators, it is a protein which is being targeted for glucose metabolism. So I was not clear if it is expressed in the fat or, or not. So what we did, but before that, just give you an introduction on PKM2. Uh, PKM2 is one of the four isoforms of the mammalian uh, family. Uh, it's expressed almost, almost exclusively in the tumor tissues. However, we and others are now beginning to find that it's expressed in the pancreatic islet cells, which are the insulin-producing cells in the, in the pancreas, and in the adipose tissue. The other point which is really important is that PKM2 is implicated in cancer metabolism and tumor growth. And work from Lucanti's lab and a few other labs now has showed that PKM2 knockdown correlates with a decreased ability of the, to form tumors. The other key point which is very relevant to my presentation today is that the tyrosine phosphorylation of PKM2, at least in cancer cells, will lead to the inactivation of PKM2. And the residue tyrosine 105 is essential for the inactivation of PKM2. So the tyrosine phosphorylation of PKM2 will lead to its inactivation. And please remember that because this is really the key point which I want to drive in terms of its interaction with PTP1B. So before we can go and, and look at the regulation of PKM2 by PTP1B, I wanted to confirm that indeed PKM2 is expressed in the adipose tissue. So along these lines, what we've done is we looked at the expression of the PKM2 protein in brown adipose cell lines, which are the cells which will express a large amount of mitochondria and are responsible for uh, energy homeostasis, and the 33L1 cells, which are more for the white fat cells, and they are used for triglyceride storage. Uh, during different days of differentiation, but sure enough, the PKM2 protein is expressed in both the brown and the white fat cells. When we look at the expression of the PKM2 in the different fat pads in the mice, this is the brown fat and the different fat pads from the mice, we see clearly that it's expressed in the different fat pads. And by the way, each lane here is a tissue from one mouse. Now, as we expected, PKM2 is not expressed in the liver and in the muscle, but the other isoforms, PKM1, is expressed in the fat and also on the muscle. So this showed us that the protein itself is expressed in the fat cell lines and in the uh, different tissues in the mice. When we went further and we looked at the, I'm not sure if you can see the staining, but hopefully you can. Uh, we looked at the staining of the pyruvate kinase in the fat depot from mice which were fed a child diet for three weeks or a high fat diet for 11 weeks. You see basically there's definitely staining in these different fat pads. The interesting thing for us was that when we looked at the tyrosine phosphorylation of PKM2 in these sections, and I hope you can see it, we found that upon high fat diet, the phosphorylation of PKM2 is decreased compared to the chow fed mice, which suggested to us that if this is true, then it suggests that the high fat feeding will lead to the regulation of PKM2 tyrosine phosphorylation. But as we all know, Immunofluorescence is sometimes tricky, so we went ahead and looked at this further in biochemical studies. So I'm showing you here data on the tyrosine phosphorylation of PKM2, and we did this in many different fat pads. I'm just showing you here two examples from the visceral fat and the subcutaneous fat. And these are from mice which we fed a chow diet or a high fat diet for three weeks, 11 weeks, or seven weeks here. And then we looked at the expression level of PKM2 and PKM1 over time. Now, as you can see here, there's no major change in the expression level of the protein, both PKM2 or PKM1. But what's really striking, and we have observed this in every single fat pad we looked at, is that under chow fed conditions, where the metabolic phenotype of the mice, where the mice are healthy, tyrosine phosphorylation of PKM2 at 105 is increased. Then as soon as you begin to put the mice on a high fat diet and the metabolic status of the mice begins to deteriorate, the tyrosine phosphorylation of PKM2 begins to drop and to decrease. And again, we saw this in so many different fat pets and this was consistent throughout. This was very interesting, but it's basically we said, you know, these are mice, will this translate to other systems? Will it translate to primates? 
So one thing in Davis is we have the monkey colony. So what we have looked at is to see if these findings translate to monkeys as well, and not only in mice and rats. And the answer is yes. So we have monkeys who were fed regular diet, then split into two groups. One were fed high fructose diet, which is not metabolically healthy for the monkeys, and they developed insulin resistance. And the other group was fed fructose diet plus fish oil, which was metabolically good for the monkeys, and the insulin resistance was less severe. And then we looked at the phosphorylation level of PKM2 in the fed pads from these monkeys, from the subcutaneous fed pad. And you see here when the metabolic status is good, there is regular phosphorylation of PKM2. When there's insulin resistance, the phosphorylation will go down, as shown here. And in the monkeys who are fed fish oil plus fructose, the phosphorylation is not down as much as the fructose-fed monkeys. So this was, gave us more confidence in the data, and it translates to uh, primates. What about humans? So we had uh, some studies done in the CTSC at Davis as well. We had people who were fed, and these were human subjects who were overweight or obese subjects, and they were fed fructose or glucose for different time points. And then we took the subcutaneous fat from the human subjects and looked at phosphorylation of PKM2 as well in these subjects. And again, it's clear that when you have the fructose feeding, metabolic status goes bad, you have decreased phosphorylation of PKM2, but in the case of fructose, but not in the case of glucose. So this told us that PKM2 is expressed in the adipose tissue, and tyrosine phosphorylation and presumably activation is regulated in rodents, uh, monkeys, and humans. So now we can go further and look at the mechanism of regulation of PKM2 by, by PTP1B. So if our hypothesis is correct and PKM2 is indeed a substrate of PTP1B, we expect the following. We expect that in cells, at least PKM2 and PTP1B should co-localize in the cells. We also expect that the PKM2 should be trapped by the mutant of PTP1B, which traps its substrates. And third, we expect that the tyrosine phosphorylation of PKM2 will increase if PTP1B is decreased. And the answer to all of this basically is yes, because otherwise I wouldn't be showing you the data. But briefly here, I'm showing you the co-localization of PTP1B and PKM2 in two different cell types. You see here in green, the expression of PTP1B, and it's nicely in the ER of the cell, as we expect. This is endogenous PKM2, and here is the merge between the two, and we see some areas of co-localization. So at least they co-localize in the cells. It does not really mean much, but at least it means that they are in the right location to potentially interact. Now, going forward, we want to see if we can see physical association and trapping of the pyruvate kinase by the mutant of PTP1B? And the answer is yes. Just to briefly take you through this uh, gel, uh, what we have done here is we immunoprecipitated PTP1B and looked for the associated PKM2 in the fat cells where we have knocked down PKM2 in all of these cells. We used lentivirus to knock down PKM2, and then we expressed either the wild-type phosphatase or the mutant substrate-trapping phosphatase. And then we expressed PKM2 wild type uh, or any phosphatase uh, mimetic of, of the mutant of the PKM2. And we look for association. So when there's no PTP1B or PKM2, you don't see association as you expect. With the wild type phosphatase and the wild type PKM2, we cannot detect association because as I told you, it's a very fast process, so we cannot really detect it. However, in the substrate trapping form of PTP1B, when it's co-expressed with PKM2, with insulin stimulation, we see very nice association. When we add the inhibitor, venidate, which will disrupt the phosphatase interacting domain, we see significant attenuation of the interaction, showing us that this is direct interaction between the active site of PTP1B and PKM2. And the mutant form of PKM2, which does not have significant phosphorylation as well, you don't see much interaction because there's not much for PTP1B to go and bind to. So this showed us that the interaction is direct. The next question was, what are the sites? What are the tyrosines on PKM2 which regulate the interaction? To cut a long story short for you, uh, we have 
looked at every single tyrosine motif on MPKM2, we generated the different cell lines. Long story short, we found that the site 105 is one of the, the sites of interaction of PKM2 and PTP1B. And this was the site I told you before was responsible for PKM2 activation. So now we have the sites of interaction. And the last point I want to mention is that what happens to PKM2 tyrosine phosphorylation when PTP1B is removed or inhibited, and indeed in cell culture systems or in the adipose tissue of the adipose PTP1B knockout mice when we looked at the tyrosine, overall tyrosine phosphorylation of PKM2 and its phosphorylation at tyrosine 105 in either the cell lines or in vivo in the mice, the tyrosine phosphorylation of PKM2 is increased when PTP1B is decreased. We have more data to, to use the PTP1B inhibitor, which I'm not showing you here today, but again, the results are, are the same. And finally, the conclusions from this presentation is that PKM2 is a novel PTP1B substrate, and PTP1B deficiency or pharmacological inhibition will increase PKM2 tyrosine phosphorylation. PKM2 tyrosine phosphorylation at 105 correlates with the metabolic status of rodents and in, in primates. And I did not have time to show you new data that we found that the deficiency of PKM2 and the white fat will lead to the generation or the formation of brown adipose-like phenotypes, and this might affect and impact the energy balance in adipose tissue. And with that, the most important slide is the lab working on the energy expenditure here. Uh, this work was started by two postdocs formerly in the lab. Now they are back in Japan having their own labs, and, the major, and with the help of a student, Jesse Baki, but really the major driving force for this project was a great postdoc, Ahmed Bitayib, shown here, who generated most of these data. These are our collaborators, Davis, Peter Havel, and Gino, and Ben, and Lou, and the funding sources. Thank you for your attention. Right, so with that, not much is known about in terms of energy regulation in the phosphatases. But it's critical that the phosphatases, all of them share the same mechanism of catalysis. They all have a cysteine, which is essential for the process of catalysis. And this cysteine is an area which has a very low pKa, making it very susceptible to oxidation. So the oxidation of the cysteine uh, of PTP1B and all the different PTPs is critical for their inactivation. Also, this cysteine is a target for nitrosylation. And this has uh, been shown by Zhu Cheng Meng, uh, who will talk tomorrow about the regulation of uh, PTP1B by nitrosylation. So basically, the modifications of that cysteine, either by oxidation and or nitrosylation, is important for the reversible inactivation of the phosphatases. And, and clearly, because we know that these phosphatases are playing a role in energy regulation, then it's basically highly likely that this modification or other modifications will affect energy balance, at least in part. Some of the PDPs are involved in enzymes in um, inflammatory uh, genes, such as NF-kappa B yes. and NF kinase. Uh, so I wonder if the downregulation of this would cause some side effect. Yeah, good point. So in fact, uh, we and others have data to show that uh, the expression of PTP1B and other PTPs are affected by inflammation markers. And there's direct regulation between obesity and inflammation, as you know, and this affects PTP1B. Having said that, when you decrease PTP1B, there seems to be decreased inflammation. If it is because primary or secondary, because of the body weight loss, we are not clear. But to answer your question, no, in fact, it's the other way around. So when you inhibit PTP1B, either by a compound, or if you delete it, inflammation will go down at least in mice.
and in some monkeys. Hey, so now you're just generating a lot of interesting data. Thank you. Uh, so, so you're showing that uh, animals fed with high fat diet or uh, fructose, yeah. the phosphorylation of PKN2 is going down. Yes. Along the, the time frame. Yeah. Do you think that uh, PK1B is more activated or the expression level is getting higher yes. in the course of the, the feeding? Yes, good point, TC. And in fact, this was one of the questions from the reviewers for the paper. Uh, so I didn't have a time to show you the data, but to answer that question, in fact, we looked at the expression of PTP1B in the same time frame. And of course, and sure enough, we saw increased expression of PTP1B when the mice were fed a high fat diet or a high fructose diet. Uh, so it correlates really nicely with the decreased phosphorylation of PKM2, because as PTP1B level and presumably activity is increasing, phosphorylation of PKM2 is decreasing. And we have done that, but the data are not here. But yes, clearly it has increased. Yes. I have a question, Dr. Khan. Uh, yes. The pyruvate kinase 2 n is at the very end of the glycolytic pathway. Yeah, very and limited. I'm trying to link this insulin resistance with obesity. And I do not know, do not remember whether in a lipo size you have insulin sensitive glucose transporters. Yes. So, so in a lipo size you have the insulin response of glucose transporter GLUT4, mm -hmm. which is responsible for the movement of glucose into or the glucose transporters, the plasma membrane, which lead to the uptake of insulin in the fat. Uh, now, as far as we know, there's no direct link between PKM2 and GLUT4. But having said that, in the same screen which we have done, we have looked, I told you we had different substrates of PTP1B. So I'm not saying that PKM2 or the insulin receptor are the only targets. We think there are other targets in the fat which regulate PTP1B action. One of them is a protein involving exocytosis of the GLUT4 vesicles and their fusion to the plasma membrane. And this is called MUNC, M-U-N-C, MUNC18C. And this is important for the fusion of the GLUT4 membranes, uh, GLUT4 vesicles to the plasma membrane in the fat for the uptake of glucose. So we think during that process, PTP1B might be able to increase the fusion of the GLUT4 vesicles and allow more glucose to go in in the fat tissue. Now, the problem with that is, as we know, in the, in the fat tissue takes only about 20% of the whole glucose in the body. Mm -hmm. And I didn't show you the data that in the body knockouts of PTP1B, there's a significant decrease in the glucose uptake, uh, increase in the glucose uptake in the fat and the muscle. So it has to be that PTP1B is also acting in the muscle. So it's acting both in the muscle and the fat together with other tissues to regulate the energy uh, and the insulin response. Uh, yes, so in fact, GLUT4 translocation, there is AKT dependence and there is also AKT independent pathway uh, of the GLUT4 translocation. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.